Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Molly, and I am an alcoholic. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I was saying that in jest, but... Um, as you were talking, I was just thinking, you know what? Sarah's one of those sponsees that you work with and talk about saying yes without hesitation. She takes every suggestion and just kind of goes with it. And it just, um, you know, she's someone who's doing the deal. So I feel very honored to be part of her journey. So, um, thank you. Um, like I said, I am a uh, recovered alcoholic. My sobriety date is January 13th, 2016. Um, I have a sponsor. Uh, she has a sponsor. I sponsor women, and I get to watch my sponsees sponsor others, which is um, which is one of the coolest things um, I've ever been a part of. Um, God, it's so funny. Like, I, I, do, do you guys? I, I don't know if anyone ever did this when they were a kid, but they're kind of like sitting in the back seat of their parents' car, and like it may be raining, and there's like a slow song on the radio, and you're like looking off. Maybe I just did this, but I like pretend I'm in the music video. <laughs> I kind of have the same experience with like fantasizing about telling my story in front of a group of people. So I'm just like, oh, like all the wisdom I'd share and just how wonderful I'd be. And then somebody asks you to do it and it, there's that kind of like um, dichotomy, like you're feeling like, oh my gosh, like, thank you. I'm so honored. Like, I can't wait to, you know, share all the solution I got. And then at the same time, you're I'm experiencing crippling fear and anxiety. Um, <laughs> because I want everyone here to like me and everybody who's going to probably rush to their computer to listen to this link and hear all the solution I got. Just kidding. Um, but anyway, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you to the Primary Purpose Group for having me. Um, my home group is the Spearheads CA meeting. Uh, we meet at Shambly Tucker Thursday nights at 8 PM. I've been a home group member there for almost two years. Um, and yeah, so I guess I'll just start from the very beginning, a very good place to start. Um, I am originally from Northern Virginia. Um, I am the youngest of four daughters I had a really normal childhood. I had a very, well, actually, I, I say that I, I had probably like the best childhood. Like I, I wanted for nothing. I have a, I have a very loving family. Um, you know, grew up really close to my sisters, wanted for nothing. Um, I played sports. I was going to summer camp. I was going to sports camps all summer. I had a ton of friends. I'm one of those people that can really kind of chameleon into any group. I've never had a problem fitting in. Um, and while I think some of that is a good thing, it's a source of a lot of it, like, um, it, it makes a lot of sense looking back when we're doing the fact finding and fact facing process of the steps. You, I can kind of look at that quality and be like, Oh, okay that makes sense. There was a lot of that going on, um, throughout kind of my whole life. And we'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, so yeah, normal childhood, great, great family. Um, when I was 12, my mom passed away from a long battle with breast cancer. Um, and I'll probably touch on this more later, but that is something that I have hidden, hidden behind for a long time and, uh, used as a great excuse to drink and, um, and kind of be comfortable in the darkness. Um, people gave me a lot of leeway with that. Um, I really leaned on that, especially in my twenties, but, um, but that's kind of where my world first came to a screeching halt and everything I thought I knew, um, changed. Um, it's funny. It's like, I'm sure everybody here has experiences like that, like wh- whatever they are, where you can kind of remember them like, like it was yesterday, every vivid detail. 
and yet it feels like I'm talking about someone else's life when I'm talking about it, if that makes sense. Um, I, you know, when I was 10, I, 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 you know, my dad called a family meeting, which did y'all have those like a family meeting, 10 minutes. And it's like, Oh, that's never good. So, um, gather in the family room and my mom is crying and we're talking about like the toughest woman on the face of the planet. Like she was one of those people that's like, never let them see you sweat. Um, and never appeared to be insecure. Like never, never, I, I never saw her lacking in any confidence or strength. And, um, and so we're sitting in there and my dad's holding her and he's just like, you know, mom's cancer's back. I guess she had been in remission my whole life, but I didn't know that. Cause you know, for the decade I was alive was the decade that she was doing just fine. So, um, you know, I'm looking around, my sisters are crying and it's like, it, it, it's just one of those, it's one of those times where you're just like, what? Like, it's like, it's clear and you kind of understand, but how could you understand at that age? You know? So, um, so then two years pass, it gets worse and worse. And eventually on, uh, May 4th, 2001, she passes away. And, um, this, this moment, and I talk about it when I tell my story, just because it's, it's a pivotal one for me was, um, the principal came up and, or the guidance counselor came up and got me from the cafeteria. And again, my mom at that point was in the hospital, which I now realized was where she knew she was not going to make it out of. And I think she might've even told us that, but again, you know, as a like 12 year old, you're kind of like, no, 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 like not possible. So we're walking down and, and I know, like, I remember the feeling in my stomach was like, I think I know what I'm about to walk into, which was the principal's office where my whole family was. It was like deja vu all over again, my sisters and my dad crying. And my dad walked up to me and was like, mom died. And, um, I, it's so many things happen in such a short amount of time. I looked around and saw everyone around me crying. And I remember thinking, you can't, you can't be upset here right now. There's no room for it. You need to be what mom kind of was for us. Like you need to be the the sun, the light up the room. You need to not experience what everyone else happens to be experiencing because they're just, dad can't handle another daughter upset. Um, and that's kind of, that's kind of a constant throughout my life. Um, I don't call it, um, I don't call it, um, it's my fiance. I, I was, um, actually going to share from the very beginning that no matter how much time you get, you, you, you still get resentful. I'm like, Oh, my fiance is going to be late. God, dang it. <laughs> but bless him. He's, he's wonderful. So, um, but, um, but that was, that's kind of like a constant throughout my life. It's not, um, it's not, you know, I think people get confused with calling it people pleasing like that kind of, that, that kind of thing going on. But Um, a great speaker, Katie Parker said, she's like, I mean, if you look around your life, who's pleased, nobody. And it's more, much more of a approval sucking. Um, and that's, that's definitely something that I am, am guilty of for sure. Um, so after that, my dad meets a great woman. He ends up marrying her. She's still my stepmom to this day. So the family kind of is back together, like dad, mom, role, sisters, um, everything kind of makes sense again. And, um, and again, I kind of went through my, uh, the rest of my middle school and high school years, like really unscathed, like nothing abnormal, like sneaking alcohol, like most people do and refilling it with the water. And then you slowly see that vodka bottle in the freezer start to actually freeze. And then, you know, your parents are going to be like, this is, this is being replaced with not liquor. Um, and, uh, but nothing, no run-ins with the law. No, no, at at no point did I think in my early twenties or teen years that I had any sort of issue. Um, went on through college. I earned a scholarship to play lacrosse at a university that I'd been dreaming about going to. And so I, um, you know, I kind of felt like I was in a really good place. I'd kind of done things that I said I was going to do and 
um, made, made my family proud. Um, and, uh, and then after college, um, I, I moved to New York and even there, I'm still, um, kind of, I mean, I don't know if anybody's lived in New York. It's just, it's just a faster city. So, you know, you kind of, you kind of naturally can find groups of people that can justify what you're doing and can behave similarly to you. So you don't really ever think there's a glaring issue. Um, so I was up there for a few years and, um, dabbled in some other, uh, some other, uh, I don't even know how to say it. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, substances. That's a great, um, but, uh, so then I moved back to DC. So, so I went up to New York to pursue a career in performance. Um, which if you, if you can't tell by, by what I was talking about earlier, it's like when somebody asked me to speak, I'm like, Ooh, yes. Like give me the spotlight. I love the spotlight, but also like, Oh, like don't like, I'm like, stop. Um, <laughs> You know, so, so acting was a way, I mean, I loved performing. I loved taking on somebody else's persona. I loved using other people's words and bringing them on stage and making people feel something. And, um, you know, it was very fulfilling for a while until it wasn't. Um, it was a, a really tough industry to be in. And as, as things started to not go as I'd hoped they would, the drinking progressed. Um, you know, I was waiting tables up there, which is what a lot of, uh, people in entertainment or actors do up there. And it's just kind of a diff, you know, it's an, it's a late life, a late night life. And, um, so I kind of got, I, I, that's when I, I, I think kind of like my steady decline. And then there was an opportunity for me to move back to where I'm from Northern Virginia and DC and, um, sing, which I'm like, Oh my God, like this would be great. Like, you know, New, the New York thing's not really working out. Let me try this geographic change and see if that does something. Um, so I moved back to DC and again, um, things are okay for a while. And then as we start performing more and more, things just start getting a little weird. Um, I mean, the book talks about like at a certain at a certain point we lose the power of choice and drink. And I don't know when that was, but it was sometime during that period where I think I had one moment where I was like, I haven't not had a sip of alcohol in a while, but then that, that quickly like leaves my mind. I'm like, Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Whatever. Um, but it was sometime during that period that I started to really, um, lose control. Um, I was never a wake up and drink person. Um, I was like a, once I start, I cannot stop person. And, um, it, I mean, it truly did something for me that nothing ever had, um, until that point. It's almost like I didn't know what I was missing until I had found, that it was 100% my solution to whatever was going on. And I should say too, like, again, like, I mean, I've touched on the fact that I had a very normal upbringing, but I mean, something really weird happens when you are portraying that character to the outside world. And it has, it, it, it does not line up with how you feel or what you feel. And that can cause a lot of conflict. Um, and it certainly did for me. It's, I mean, it still can, you know, if I'm not, if I'm not on my game, it still can to this day. So, um, you know, I, 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 to the outside world, everything was fine. I mean, we were performing all the time. My family would always come and see, I even got an opportunity to audition for American Idol. And that was like, so exciting. My whole family, we went up to New York, we saw the judges, like, I mean, life appeared to be good. Um, and then one night, I mean, like one night I, I guess I, I, I had a bad habit. I mean, I, I think a lot of people in the rooms maybe talk about stealing or things that they did, like the bitter, incomprehensible demoralization. Like maybe you went into Walmart and took something you shouldn't have, or um, maybe you embezzled or that kind of stealing. 
I never stole like monetary things, but I had a bad habit of stealing people that stealing people from people, people that were in relationships with other people. Um, and, um, I didn't care. I really didn't. Um, it's like in my mind at the time, it was like, it was just the ultimate validation you could possibly have is somebody who's unattainable by law that finds you interesting and attractive and, um, talk about going down a shame hole. When you wake up out of that drunk, you're kind of like, Ooh, I don't, you know, I don't really feel good about that. I'm going to not, I'm not going to do that again. Um, I had a lot of moments like that where I would wake up and be like, I'm not, I'm not doing that again. Like that, that was the last time. And if you had hooked me up to a lie detector test, I would have told you that it was the last time. Um, and, uh, one, you know, as, has the drinking got worse? I mean, one night I found myself, um, you know, I, I, I had woken up and I had an, engaged in what would become a year and a half long affair with my older sister's husband. So we're talking about, you know, somebody who grew up with a normal upbringing to going to a university, play sports, had a family who loved her, was pursuing her dreams in, in New York and everything looked like it was going okay to how did I get here? And, um, I always go back and forth. I mean, like when I first came into the rooms, I literally, I was like, I am never sharing that with another human being ever, let alone ever from a podium. Um, but you know, it's, it's such a huge part of where my drinking took me that, um, that it just, you know, it, 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 it it's just, um, anyway. Um, so once that began, it was like all, you know, all bets are off. Like I then started on a path of lying and causing destruction to my entire family. So like, if, if you can imagine, like they have three small kids, like we're having holidays together. I mean, the lying, the lying never stopped. Um, and it just continued for a really long time. And it ended up being a very volatile relationship and a very, um, sad situation. Uh, and it got to a point where, you know, people were starting to find out like, what are we going to do? And it was like, okay, you're going to go back to New York. You're going to get a job, go back to New York and get out of here. So this can kind of quiet down. So that's what I did. I got a great job on wall street in New York. I was really excited about it. I moved up there. Um, and, and, and talk about being a producer of confusion. Like I, I literally, like my family was like, wait, you're going where? Like you're going back. Like you just were, you were saying how miserable you were in New York and now you're coming and now you're back, but now you're going like, what, where did this all happen? And I'm just like, no, I'm just like really excited. I'm giving up singing. I'm giving up acting. Like, you know, that this is what I want to do. So they were like, okay, so I guess we have to be supportive of it. Um, so I get up there on a Thursday and I'm staying with my friend and her husband and, um, they're like, you can stay with us for a few months until you find a place. It's easier to find a place once you're up here. I was like, great. And, um, and, uh, that Saturday night we all went out, um, and sometime around four in the morning, I had lost control yet again. Um, and was in a, in a fight with, with this person that I had just left and, and was trying to pull myself away from. And I had this moment of like, Oh my God, I'm going to be tethered to this lie for the rest of my life. I, I can't, I can't do it anymore. And, um, and so I, you know, I, I did what any normal person does and, um, swallowed a bottle of, um, whatever anti-anxiety medication I had tricked a psychiatrist into giving me at, at that point. And, um, 
and then woke up in the emergency room in Queens, New York. And my parent, I look, I like open my eyes and I see my parents are out there talking to my friend and her husband. And I'm like, Oh sh- shoot, shoot. Um, and I knew, I knew I was so scared, but it, it's weird. It's like all, almost like I was like relieved in a way, but still very nervous. I didn't know what was to come. I didn't know what, I didn't know where I'd be going or what anyone knew. I didn't know what Sam was going to tell my family. And my parents were like, and by, by, by the way, so this is like Sunday afternoon that I wake up and they're like, we're, we're taking you home. And I was like, but I have to start my job tomorrow. And they were like, no, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Um, <laughs> God, I mean, and, and I was so mad. Like, I remember being mad, like, no, you guys leave, like, leave me here, please. Like I can figure this out. And they were just like, no. And so I was like, uh, you know, okay. I get in the car, I sleep the whole way home. And then as so much of this is a blur, I, you know, I spent a lot of the time sleeping, but I, again, like my parents were sitting on my bed and they were talking about inpatient treatment. And again, I like, I'm sure some people can identify, like, it's like, absolutely not. I'm like, I'll do outpatient, but I'm not going anywhere where I'm going to be cut off from my phone and, and alcohol. I mean, I couldn't, I got to the point where I couldn't, you know, that place where you talk about, like, I, I couldn't imagine my life with or without alcohol anymore. Um, and by the way, I had alienated everyone around me. Like I, I'm, I must have glossed over that, but like, I, I mean, I got, I had nothing like my sisters didn't know. My family didn't know what I was up to at this point. Right. So they're kind of shocked. They're like, Oh, we didn't know like you had a problem because I had alienated everybody and had gotten so good at presenting at the one family function a month and then leaving and going to do my thing. I didn't have friends. Like I, I, I didn't call anybody. I mean, I literally like hung out in an apartment. Like I would like go to work, like, Oh God bless those women that, um, employed me. I mean, they tried so like they, you know, I'm like, no, I have allergy. I'm like, I'm sick. Like I'm, <laughs> and, and they're like, they fight. I remember, I, I don't know why I'm just thinking of this, but the woman, woman called me who owned the shop and she was like, I mean, like, are you okay? Like, is it, is it drugs? <laughs> like, are you drinking? Like, like, is it depressed? And I'm like, no, I'm just like really depressed. And like, and, and at that point I had, I had gone to the psychiatrist. I mean, I was in therapy, but not sharing anything honestly about what I was using and in how much, what capacity I was drinking. You know, when you go to the doctor's office and it's like, how many cocktails do you have per week? It's like box one, one to two, box two, three to four, box three is like five, to seven. And I'm like, Every, I mean, everybody must lie because, well, anyway, um, but I wasn't giving any, I, I wasn't giving therapy or anything a real shot. Cause I just was sharing kind of, kind of what I wanted to share to get what I wanted. And, um, so I, was, I, was, I, I mean, I remember telling her name is her, her name is Neil. And, and I was like, I'm just really depressed. Like, you know, just like sucking all of the like pity I could out of her, but on some level, not being totally aware that I was being fully manipulative. Um, and that's interesting too, like looking back over the course of my life, especially in addiction, but long before, or in, um, alcoholism, long before I ever picked up a drink, there are these times where like, I can kind of get what I want at the expense of others. See what I'm saying? Um, so I had people, and I actually had friends that would reach out and just kind of be like, hey, dude, are you okay? And I'm like, yes, what do you mean? And then that anxiety of like, what? who's talking about me? What, is, what are people saying? Like, do they know how much I'm drinking? Like, do they know what I'm doing? And, um, and so eventually I just stopped answering the phone and stopped answering texts. Um, I mean, it was like anyone on the outside would have looked at that and been like, what are you doing? But if you're like me, you know that I couldn't not. Um, so on January 13th, oh, and something else like, like on Monday. And so I know I'm going to treatment. My dad's like, call this. I mean, we got recommended this place, Karen and Pennsylvania Karen treatment center, which like 
is, you know, I, I happen to love rehab. It's probably like the most fun I never want to have again, honestly. Um, but uh, I called Karen. My dad was like, you call and, and set up when you can. they can take you in. And it was Wednesday. So on Monday and Tuesday, I went to the grocery store. And now it makes so much sense. I got those little, like a little four pack of the baby wine bottles. And both nights I like took, but I was, I, I hid it in my purse and took it up. It's just, you know. Looking at you're like, of course, but at the time, I don't know. Um, so on January 13th, we drive to Pennsylvania and my parents dropped me off in, um, ooh, in, a, in an intake room at any facility. Oh my God. You want to compare out, like go there. I'm like, Ooh, I do not look like you or you or you. Like I'm in the wrong, like we've made a mistake here. Um, I'm so terrified and so scared. And, you know, my parents drive off and they take my phone and they're like, we're going to keep you in detox one, one night. And I'm like, okay. So I just go into a room with a cot and I had nothing. I had nothing to do. I mean, I had no one to call. I literally had not, I mean, I don't even think I had books at that point. Um, and I laid down and fell asleep and woke up what uh, probably like four hours later. And I was just like, damn, I'm so happy to be here. And, uh, I mean, I'm sure I missed a lot of like the dark and twisty stuff, but man, if I, if I could convey to anybody new, I mean, like, I've been there. It is so hard. But seriously, thank God for whatever intervened that day. Um, because it it is the only time I've really tried to get sober. But had I not been as broken and beaten into that state of, you know, reasonableness, I think the book calls it. I don't know if I'd still be sober. I was done. Um, and I was so done. In fact, that I was willing to do what anybody told me to do any suggestion. Um, I had a little bit of like, I'm going to be the perfect rehab patient going on. Like, <laughs> Like I, like all the intake nurses, like, I, I mean, they were all like, oh, you're such a breath of fresh air. And I'm like, oh yeah, like, no worries. I'm just going to like be in my room, like my detox room, like come get me for the drug test or like for the whatever. And, uh, so the first, and I was only supposed to go for 30 days. So I, I get, I get there and I'm, you know, I'm so grateful and so happy that like, I start to feel like the, the weight, kind like a little weight coming off my shoulder. So I'm like, Oh my God, like I don't have anything to do, but be here. So I, I make it up and, um, and I have my first meeting with my counselor and she's like, you know, you know, we're, we're like chatting and I'm still like, you know, it really, you know, I was doing this with my, you know, brother-in-law at the time. It sounds so sick when I'm like, I'm doing that. It's really just like, like my therapist calls it situational depression. And she's like, <laughs> I remember Jackie, I mean, thank God for her. And she was just like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, so, um, she was like, let me ask you something. When you start drinking, how many like cocktails do you have? I'm like, well, it like varies. Like sometimes I go out to dinner and have like a couple glasses of red wine. And like, sometimes I go out and like, I don't know. She's like, so you don't know when you're going to stop really when you start. It's like, no. And at, th at this point, like they, they'd handed me this exact, I mean, this is the book I got in treatment. Like I, I hadn't read it yet. And, um, and I was clinging to my NA book cause I was hoping I'd be able to get out of there with like just a drug problem and no, like I could like be like, Oh, like I don't belong with you freaks. Like I'm, I'm good to go with the drinking. Um, I hadn't even cracked this thing open. So I, I, I kind of, I didn't know she was like hand, giving me the test questions, you know? So I'm like, Oh I, no. Yeah, definitely. Definitely couldn't stop. Once I started, definitely not. No. And she's like, yeah. So, you know, and she starts like trying to just like talking through this and 
for the first 30 days, probably, I really, I really didn't want this to be a problem for me. Like I really believed on some level that I was going to get well here and, and leave and be okay and go back to go to the, the job that's waiting for me in New York to those very nice people that, by the way, I told them where I was and, and they were just like, oh my God, job's waiting for you whenever. You know, like, I mean, I have no right to have, to have had nice people in my life at that point. But, um, but, I, but I kind of start like buying in a little bit and then we would have outside speakers come into our treatment center along with going to outside meetings and this woman, JJ came and spoke and I swear, I mean, I don't even remember the intricacies of her story or the details of it. It really doesn't matter. But something she said, I like, I was like, that's, that's it. That's, that's me. Like she knows what I'm talking about. She's putting words to something that I had no words for. I didn't understand that this book and this program had very little to do with alcohol and everything to do with alcoholism. And so I went up to her and I was like, hey, I need a temporary sponsor. Will you temporarily sponsor me? And she's like, sure. So she came and met, she came to Karen every week and met with me and took me through the steps, like was taking me through the book. We were reading it line by line. And I'm telling you guys, I would get home at night because, you know, I mean, if anyone's been to rehab, you have full days. Like, they they fill you up with, with stuff. So I get home, and I'm, like, all of a sudden, like, I'm getting home to read this. Like, I'm rereading, and I'm, like, under – I mean, like, I have such an attachment to this book in particular just because it's the one that they gave me. But, I mean, like, I'm looking at stuff I underlined when I was first reading it, like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> wow. Like, the, uh, yeah, the, the craving. Yeah. Like I get that. Like it explained things for which I could not otherwise account. Like, wh- I didn't know why I had to drink. Like what, when people are like, why do you have to get so, so messed up? And I'm like, you know, that part in the book where it's like, you may actually get an honest answer out of him. Like, I don't know. So a tremendous amount of relief again is like washing over me as I'm like, I'm like, holy crud. <laughs> I, this, this book that was written. So, I mean, like there, there's something to this, right? Like a, a message of depth and weight at some point was being conveyed to me. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know when along that time, but so anyway, so I was supposed to be there for 30 days and something happens where I'm like, I got to tell my family what's up because all these calls with my parents, they're like, we feel like we're missing something. Like we know, like we're very sad. Like mom died. We totally get it. Like for sure. And again, I'm like putting that out. I mean, that is what I'm telling them. Like, and I've been telling people for a long time as my drinking got worse was I just like been through a lot. And, um, and I don't even know if I knew that's what I was doing. I'm sure I did, but you know, I, I believed it. And, and it's like, and it's that way with alcoholics. Like we're not in denial about anything. Um, what did I hear? Uh, Dave, um, I forget his last initial, but he was like, Al-Anons have denial. Alcoholics have delusion. And it's because we don't, we cannot differentiate the truth from the false. Like I believe the stories I'm telling myself, which is like scary. Um, uh, so, um, so anyway, so, 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 so like, you know, something's in me. Like, I got to tell I got to tell my family what's going on. And, um, and I did. And, you know, what's so cool about the truth, um, is that once you say it, I don't know if anyone in here has like held any deep, dark secrets for a long period of time. Once you say the truth, it's out. And beyond that, you really, um, you really have no control over what happens after that. But, um, my parents met, you know, over the phone. I mean, I can hear my dad like hyperventilating as I'm like, I got to tell you something really big. And, you know, they were just like, okay, this may, it's almost like they, they're like, oh, finally, like this makes sense now. Like how this all happened. It's, we're not failures as parents. Like we didn't do this to you. We weren't missing like, like this makes sense. So come clean to my whole family. And as you can imagine, my sister, you know, it just rips apart my entire family. 
Um, and, uh, and it bought me another four months in rehab. <laughs> um, they're like, you can't leave yet. <laughs> um, and thank God that they let me stay. I, I went to a women's extended care program with that was on the same like property. And, um, I don't know guys, I loved rehab. Um, uh, one of the girls I went to rehab with is in my upcoming, uh, upcoming wedding. And it's like, um, I mean, thank God. I mean, I am, I, I, I don't have experience with coming in and coming back out, but I'll tell you this, I was separated. Um, that part in the book where it talks about, you know, it's, you know, they need to be sober for a bit before you can start to like convey this message. So they're not foggy. So, I mean, I gave up on the New York idea and that's the other thing too, guys, like, I don't know, like, it's not me to like, listen to other people. They were like, we strongly suggest you go to sober living and we suggest you do it in a city where you don't have any history. And I was just like, okay, where? And it was between St. Paul, Minnesota and Atlanta. And I was like, yeah, we're going to go with Atlanta. <laughs> um, and I, um, and, and they're, they're a really big fan of door to door treatment, a uh, door to door service. So I flew right from Philly airport to Atlanta. I got picked up by the counselor at Hope Homes and that started my six month journey at Hope Homes, um, in sober living. So I walked out of a structured environment, environment with 11 months sobriety. So, you know, it was between five months of treatment and six months of, uh, sober living. I mean, I, I really got, an I really had an opportunity to, um, really make it. And so when I first got to Atlanta, I, um, JJ's like, love working with you. Let's stay in touch, but you need to get a sponsor down there. So I go to the 10 AM at 8111 and it's, the, it's, it's in the book, big book study. And these two just like, uh, uh you know, uh, you know, those people that walk into a room and they just command their, the presence of the room. It's like these two women, Meredith and Eileen, they were leading like the big book. And I just like, I mean, I was like a dog staring at a bone. I was like that, what that woman has, I want it. Like she was tough. She was funny and she knew the book inside and out. So I like walk up to her and I'm like, hi, like I'm Molly. We sponsor me. And she's like, Oh, <laughs> she's like, are you an alcoholic? And I'm like, yes. And she's like, are you willing to go to any lengths? And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And she's like, okay, open your book. I don't think I have, did I write it in my book? She's like, um, I want you to call me every day. Let's pick the time. I want you to call me every day at this time, not a minute before, not a minute after. And I want you to tell me you're one of hers. You're in the front row. Yep. That you're one of hers. So, so you'll know what I'm talking about. She hasn't changed and I love it. So She's like, I want you to tell me what meeting you've gone to, um, any pressing issues and, um, and, um, oh, what page you're on in the big book guys. <laughs> it's so funny what happens, especially when, when you're new, it's like, I'm, you know, beaten into a state of reasonableness and I want to ask somebody for their help. And then they start like giving me stuff to do. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> why am I doing this? Um, why do I have to do this? And again, like I had kind of like, I'm like, well, I have like five months sober. Like I know something about sobriety and it's just like, it's so funny. Like she always reminded me that I actually knew nothing. Um, <laughs> and it's like, she'd be like, get to a meeting 30 minutes early, clean the buck hands, sit in the front row and no sharing. And again, I mean, like, like everything in me wanted to be like, you're nuts. Like no sharing don't people want to hear what I have to say? And she's like, no, <laughs> nobody wants to hear what you have to say yet. Like you have nothing to offer anybody. You need to listen. And I was like, okay. So that's what, that was my first introduction into actually using my ears and my mouth and the proportion that God gave me two to one. So I just was like, all right, I'm going to do what this woman says. And I did that for six weeks. So six weeks of talking to this woman every day at the same time. I mean, I think I called her late twice. And one time I did, she's like, it was like two minutes late. She's like, are you drunk? I'm like, no. <laughs> She's like, I can't think of any other reason than why you'd call me late. I'm like, oh man, like, oh, I screwed this up. So, um, you know, and so I do that for six weeks and then she, we pick a weekend and I, we work all day Saturday and all day Sunday. We work the steps and I come out of the, I come out of there tired and lit on fire. 
like I'm talking about, she's like, now you share in every meeting and you raise your hand when somebody needs a sponsor and you go up to every woman who picks up a white chip because you have something to offer. I was listening to um, somebody this morning talking to a, a, a newcomer and uh, talking about just what sponsorship would look like. And he said, I'm taking you through the way I was taken through. And we're going to do all 12 steps so that you can take other people through because otherwise it's a lot. It's not, it doesn't mean anything. And I've been thinking about that all day. Just she was, it, it wasn't about the cleaning of the buck hands. It wasn't about not sharing. It wasn't about punishing me. It was about teaching, starting to show me what it's like to be disciplined and to do what I say I'm going to do, mean what I say. And, and think about somebody other than myself. It just totally took me out of myself. And then we started to shift things into, I mean, in a program that where selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of our troubles, she was like, the antidote for that is to focus on others. And that's through sponsorship. I mean, I, I was like skimming through, I was skimming through the book a little bit today because I'm like, I'm like, oh God, like, what am I going to talk about? Like in my story, I'm like, well, maybe I'll just read the book. Like, I mean, I thought I literally was like, maybe I'll just read the doctor's opinion out loud and we'll go from there. But, um, um, you know, the amount of times that they talk about strenuous work with another alcoholic ensures permanent sobriety. Um, the word permanent was brought up at our meeting last night. If I, when I was new, I, I mean, I saw people get 30 days and I was like, oh my God, like 30 days. I remember vividly being like to my little like small group of treatment being like, and I have a week sober. And everyone was like, yay. But it was monumental to me. I'd never had a week sober since I started drinking. But the idea of permanent recovery, I just, I don't even think I could have fathomed it at the time. Um, so I started, I started working with others and, um, I mean, the first year, I mean, I swear where like nobody was staying sober. I'm like, it's me. I know it's me. And, and she's like, no, 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 just keep, just keep, keep sharing and keep, you know, keep talking to these women who get white chips. And, um, you know, it was just, it started to become, you know, I started taking it a little less personally, like only an alcoholic will try to make something that is supposed to smash your ego all about yourself. Um, <laughs> just definitely something I did. Um, and you know, I don't know, guys. Like I, um, I, I've, I've, I somehow along the way, um, somehow along the way, stopped thinking about alcohol and stopped thinking about my problems so much. And I don't mean to, I don't want to like confuse anyone. Like I definitely get consumed by my stuff, but, um, you know, all of a sudden I look around and I'm surrounded by a host of friends and a fellowship of people who are like actually doing the deal. They're sponsoring people and they're going back through the steps, uh, which is something I ultimately ended up doing. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, met this woman through my, now home group. And we started going through the big book awakening, which turns all the statements in the big book to questions. And so we're really looking at, you know, we started looking at what my, what I was powerless over as somebody with a year and a half sober, um, how I was showing up a year and a half sober. Um, cause, um, I think for a long time I thought alcohol was the problem and that once I stopped drinking, hopefully my problems would be solved. And, um, that's, that is not, uh, unfortunately if it were that easy, well, if it were that easy, I think a lot more people would, uh, would stay sober, but that's just not the way it is for us. So, um, so, you know, I, I, I write, so I, I, you know, I'll just quickly kind of just go through my experience. Like, so admitting I was powerless guys was not like a real issue for me. I kind of like knew what I was up against or I had had like, I was so miserable. It kind of was pretty easy to admit that. Um, and never had an issue with the God stuff, but, um, coming to believe, or at least coming to suspect that something bigger than myself could keep me sober. If it was keeping all of y'all sober 
was very attractive to me. I don't even know if I fully believed it when I like said it, but I was like, let's just keep going. Like, we're just going to keep going. Um, and I do my inventory and I read it and, um, you know, go into six and seven and huge relief also to know that we are in, we are not in control of our character defects or when they're going to be removed. Um, I'd like to say that one pass through the steps means that everything negative about me was, it, 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 I still got, I still got a lot, a lot going on. Um, but, um, so I start making amends and, um, I still have more, still have more amends, but, um, we, we do, you know, we put our amends on, on these index cards and, we put them into columns and there's like a, a, a like a now, uh, essentially a now column, a later column, uh, uh, maybe like maybe don't have their info. And then there's like a never column, you know, like ones where you're like, I'm never making that. I'm not willing. I don't know where they are. I don't want to like just never. So I start to make all my, all my now columns. I mean, all my, um, now amends and, you know, which is like family and some of those are pretty awkward. And so, um, you know, then it's time to reach out to my sister, the one I had harmed so, so badly. And, um, I think I reached out to her three different times over the course of a year and a half. And each time it was like, no, um, which again, you know, looking back, things just kind of don't happen on my time ever. Um, so I reach out again, um, in December because I, I was going to, um, Carl and I were heading home to see my parents after Christmas. And she was like, yeah, I will. I'd, I'd love to see you. Talk about fear. Y'all. I, okay. So I love to eat. I'm always hungry. I'm like never not thinking about food. And on this flight home, cause I knew I was going to see my sister. I mean, like I, I wasn't hot. Like I, I, I like couldn't stomach food. I mean the, the fear that was, that had come over me was like uh, unimaginable. And y'all, she walked into the room and just gave me a big hug and just like held me while I cried. Like, I, I mean, I don't know what's in store with the, with the rest of my men's, but to this day, that's prop that's the most earth, like groundbreaking earth shattering, you know, smashing what I think I know about anything kind of experience where. I just don't know how things are going to look or when they're going to happen. And, um, you know, she and I are working to rebuild our relationship. I'm getting married in three weeks and she and her, um, you know, they, she just got remarried in June. She and her husband and her three kids are all coming to my wedding. And my two nieces are going to be flower girls in the wedding. I mean, I'm like not making this up that if you work these steps, and stick around and do what is asked of you and take suggestions. I mean, nothing about this. I mean, there's, there's a lot of great stuff, obviously, but, but it is not a process that is enjoyable all the time at all. Um, but it's one that has changed my life forever in the most unimaginable ways. I, um, I am so grateful that God intervened when he did. And, um, you know, there are times still where I'm like, I can't believe this is my life. I can't believe like I, I'm, you know, I look around me at the the women I get to help or the women that are around me, the, the man who's agreed to spend the rest of his life with me. Um, and the way my family has repaired itself in a much more honest and much more open and real way, you know, you know, God just, God just becomes a fact. Um, and, and, um, there is no explanation for that, or there's no, there's no formula for that other than doing what is said in this book as guided by somebody who will take you through it. Um, I just wanted to, I guess I'll close with, it's funny about sponsorship too, like my, the whole first hundreds, you know, however many pages are all, all worn and working with others isn't, it's just amazing. Um.
So this is on uh, page 164 and a vision for you. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right. And great events will come to pass for you and countless countless others. This is the great fact uh, for us. Bending yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road to happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thank you all so much for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.